All right, people of the state of Michigan versus Peyton Thompson, 226944SM. Mr. Thompson appears from his like vehicle via video Zoom. His attorney, Henry McRoberts, is present here in the courtroom. The prosecution appears through Assistant Prosecutor Alex Zeminski. Probation appears through Chief Probation Officer Amber Miller. We're set today on a request for a COBS hearing by Mr. McRoberts. Mr. McRoberts, the case is yours. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, it's been quite some time since I've done a COBS hearing, but I did file a motion. And uh, as the court's well aware, because I know that the court has conducted one already in this case, there's uh, Mr. Thompson is charged with two counts, one assault aggravated, the second masks disguised both misdemeanors, the first count being a one-year misdemeanor. Mr. Thompson is considering pleading uh, no contest to the pending charges. Uh, there is no plea agreement. There's, there would be no, nothing given to them as part of him. Part of that is just straight up. That being said, there was a recommendation drafted by the probation officer, Ms. Miller, who's in court today, uh, that sets forth uh, some sentencing recommendations based on the incident. It also has a synopsis of the incident. And uh, we're asking the court, the court's position on the proposed recommendations uh, as whether they would be willing to follow those if a plea was entered at the time of sentencing or if they weren't followed, they would allow a plea to be withdrawn. All right, thank you, Mr. McRoberts, Mr. Siminski. Your Honor, I have received and reviewed the pre-sentence report. Uh, Mr. McRoberts is correct. There is no plea offer. Um, essentially, the only offer is to plea as charged to both of the charged accounts. Uh, in reviewing the report, I don't see any factual inconsistencies. And certainly, the proposed outcome is within the realm of possibilities based on the one-year maximum of the aggravated assault. Uh, I'm sure this court is aware it's had several sentencings already on other defendants that were involved in the same incident. I'm sure the court is aware of the people's position regarding sentencing. Um, we're similarly situated in this case. Uh, likewise, I'm sure the court is aware of the victims and victims' uh, guardians' position on these matters. So I'd ask the court to take that into consideration with any sort of All right. Well, in respect to this matter <clears throat> concerning the cops' plea, as I stated in Mr. Zanone's file, I went through a detailed analysis of what the COBS is about, the requirements, the reasoning behind it. I'm going to take judicial notice of that for this file as far as I'm not going to read back into the file the particular excerpts from excerpts from the um, COBS hearing or the COBS case, I should say. Um, suffice it to say, I have been through most all of the information. I did receive a few new pieces of information today. Ms. Uh, Danielson is here in court. This is Levi, is that right? Yes. And um, Mr. Trenton McWilliams' brother Levi is also present here with the victim witness coordinator, Ms. Larson. So I did receive a letter. Uh, it was stamped, received by the court yesterday dated uh, November 8th regarding Mr. Zanone. I read this, I'm not sure why this was just coming to the court on December 12th when it was dated November 8th, but I have that. I also have a letter concerning Mr. Peyton Thompson um, that was received yesterday dated December 6th, it looks like. I have photographs that I've looked at. Um, I have the victim impact statement. I'd seen that before but I do have that as well, along with all of the other documents that I have uh, reviewed concerning the other cops hearing and um, the sentencing on one of the co-defendants here. So there are voluminous uh, reports from the police department. I've read the um, 
the Neuro Team Bell and Health Psycho Neuropsychological Evaluation. I received that the day after the last COBS hearing, um, along with all of the other various documents here, the physician clinical reports, all the medical reports. There's probably about four or five inches of reports here. Concerning the matter in regard to Mr. Thompson, I've looked at the recommendations. One thing I didn't say to you that I regretted saying that's been on my mind since the last time we were here when you encouraged me not to take the plea from Mr. Zanone. <laughs> Back to our civics days of high school. Um, the purpose of a jury, okay, they're the fact finders and they can make a decision about whether or not the prosecutor's office has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant has committed whatever crime that they've been charged with. The prosecuting attorney's office has, under the separation of powers, they have the decision-making ability about what charges to bring. The court is not involved in that aspect at all. Okay, and the court, the court doesn't normally even get police reports until or unless there's either a guilty plea or a finding of guilt. We don't have all that information. We, we come in pretty much clear like a jury does. So in that particular case, like any of these, all a jury could do is determine, well, not all, I mean, what they will be doing is determining guilt or innocence. But like with Mr. Zanone, uh, there was nothing for a jury to really hear because he pled straight up to everything to the fullest, okay? So even if a jury was here, it wouldn't have gotten any better than what Mr. Zanone pled to, all right? Function of the judge is always to determine the appropriate sentence. Okay, so those are two different jobs. So in respect to taking the plea on Zanone or Mr. Thompson or any of these, you can't get any better. A jury could do no better than to find them guilty on whatever counts. So he's telling me, Mr. McRoberts is telling me that Mr. Thompson would be pleading straight up to both of the charges filed that's as good as a jury trial is going to get you. Then the sentencing becomes the discretion of the court. All right, is that clear for you? All right. In respect to Mr. Thompson, what differs between him and Mr. Zanone is that Mr. Thompson has already had the benefit of a delayed sentence. And I would not be inclined to go along of a delay of sentence under those circumstances. He had his whack at the apple. He was apparently on probation at the time that this incident was charged. There was no probation. Was he on probation when this came up? He was on probation when the incident was alleged to have occurred, but no charges had been filed prior to his discharge. All right. So he was discharged from probation without the probation or the court knowing that these other charges, these other charges had not been filed yet. So that's how that all took place. Um, apparently, it must have taken a while for the police to get their investigation done, for the prosecuting attorney's office to decide what charges to file. So Mr. Uh, Thompson was released from probation, and he got lucky on that, but I will not be going along with any delay of sentence. I can tell you that right now. He had his opportunity. It's my belief when nobody, when somebody does not have a prior criminal record, depending, of course, on the egregiousness and all of the other facts, that they should have an opportunity to work their way through and keep it off their record. Mr. Thompson already had that opportunity, and he's lucky he didn't get violated on probation, lose that delay of sentence in addition to deal with these charges. So. To that extent, I would not be going along with the pre-sentence report as I see it here, right here, right now, based on the information available to me as we sit here on today's date. Otherwise, I am, you know, the um, restitution is not filled in here. There is restitution. I, it would be my inclination and what I've ordered already is to make it joint and severable between all the defendants. So to the extent that that's not included on this pre-sentence report, I will be requiring that. Um, so in respect to the other recommendations here, based on what I've you know, been privy to at this point in time, um, outside of the delay of sentence, I think that I would in all likelihood go along with this recommendation. 
he would be serving approximately 29 days in jail. And if he complies with the terms of his probation, the balance of time will be, well, at this point, 60 days suspended, but he would be looking at the potential for the one year should he violate his probation. That is all gonna be hanging out there over his head. So that's where I am on this at this point in time, Mr. Um, McRoberts. Okay, Your Honor, I will discuss that with Mr. Thompson and uh, likely schedule this matter for a plea hearing that works with the court schedule. All right, then Mr. Uh, Siminski, anything else you wanted to say? No, Your Honor. How about you, Ms. Miller? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, then you have any general questions today, Ms. Danielson, Mr. McWilliams? Is his name McWilliams too? No. Right, what's your last name? Danielson. All right, Levi Danielson. No questions? No, you're right. All right. All right, then, um, Mr. Thompson, you have a discussion with your lawyer uh, right now. What do we have for court date? March, right? Or do we March have a 14th? Yes. All right. You let me know. Thank you. We'll be up. Use the amended complaint changes it to charges. One count of domestic violence, count one, count two, assault and or assault and battery. Count three is the same, the weapons, firearm, reckless use. In respect to the domestic violence, then the following are the maximum penalties you face on conviction. up to 93 days in jail, up to a $500 fine plus court costs are added on. <clears throat> Federal law and or state law will prohibit you from possessing or purchasing ammunition or a firearm, including a rifle, a pistol, or a revolver. If you are convicted of a misdemeanor crime of violence and you are a current or former spouse, parent, or guardian of the victim, you share a child in common with the victim, you are or were cohabitating with the victim as a spouse, parent, or guardian, or you are or were involved with the victim in another similar relationship. Concerning assault and battery, the maximum is up to 93 days in jail and or up to a $500 fine plus court costs are added on. Concerning the firearm reckless use, that's a 90 day maximum misdemeanor and or up to a $500 fine plus court costs are added on. The court may suspend your hunting privileges for up to three years. And concerning the matters then, you might have difficulty entering into a foreign country as a result of these convictions. And or if you're not a citizen of the United States, a conviction may result in removal or deportation from the United States, exclusion from admission to the United States, or the denial of naturalization. Do you understand the nature of the charges then and the maximum penalty? Yes. All right, to the three amended charges, what are your what is your plea? Are you asking me? Uh, yes. Guilty. All right. Before I accept your guilty plea, Mr. Capel, I want to make sure you understand the rights you're giving up by pleading guilty. Do you understand then by pleading guilty, there's not going to be either a jury trial nor a bench trial? Okay. Two. Do you understand that, Mr. Capel? You have to answer out loud. Yes, I do. All right, Mr. Capel, I have an advice of rights and plea information form with your signature. Did you understand all of the rights contained in this form before you signed it? Yes, I did. Do you understand then as well, a consequence of pleading guilty is that you give up the right to exercise each of the trial rights listed in the form? Yes, I do. Do you understand the court is free to impose any sentence that the court feels is appropriate up to the maximum provided by law? However, if I'm unwilling to go along with concurrent sentencing, I'm assuming that's between counts, then I should ask for clarification. Is that right, Mr. Seibold, Mr. Siminski? That's my understanding. Yes. 
All right, if I'm not willing to go along with that, I will give you an opportunity to withdraw your plea and pursue a trial. Do you understand that? Yes. Understanding that and the other things I've gone over here with you, does it remain your intention to plead guilty? Yes. Are you presently on probation or parole to any court? Just the rules you guys have in place so far. Okay, the bond release form, you mean? Yes, yes. All right, but you're not reporting to a probation or a parole officer, are you? No. All right, then outside of the terms placed on the record, has anybody promised you anything in order to get you to plead guilty? No. Has anybody forced you or coerced you in any way to get you to plead guilty? No, Your Honor. Has anybody told you the courts would be more lenient with you if you pled guilty? No, Your Honor. Are you pleading guilty freely, voluntarily, and understandingly? Yes, Your Honor. All right, we're going to make out the elements of the offenses as amended. The complaint indicates this occurred on or about November 12th, 2022 in the city of Iron Mountain, County of Dickinson, State of Michigan. Do you agree with that? Yes, Your Honor. In respect to count one, which is the domestic violence, who is the victim of that then? Is that William Yacht or count two is about Bobby Joe Phillips? The domestic violence refers to Ms. Phillips and the assault and battery refers to Mr. Yacht. All right. Count one is domestic violence regarding Bobby Joe Phillips. In your own words, how did you uh, commit domestic violence regarding Ms. Phillips? Alleges, allegedly brandishing a firearm. All right, well, um, we're talking about realities now, not allegedly. So in respect to the matter, were you in a dating relationship with Ms. Bobby Jo Phillips? Yes, Your Honor. And we and you co were in it. What? We're co occupants. All right. And you were co occupants on November 12th of this year? Yes, Your Honor. Even though she removed herself in the lease in October. You were both living there on November 12th? Yes, ma'am. All right. And this occurred in the city of Iron Mountain. What is that on Fifth Street? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and you had had, according to this complaint, you and Ms. Uh, Phillips had had an argument earlier in the day. Yes, Your Honor. All right, so you said allegedly with uh, brandishing a weapon, so how you made an assault on Ms. Phillips with a revolver, is that my understanding? I don't know the definition of assault. I feel assault doesn't take place, but to agree to the uh, terms of well, the deal. Well, let me tell you what an assault is. You can either have an assault and or an assault and battery. A battery is a completed touching on some level. An assault Why didn't you is... An assault is if you take some actions that put somebody reasonably in immediate fear of a potential battery. Is that what happened here? I guess assault would be accurate then. All right, so you were angry with her, you got the revolver out and what, waved it around or while you were yelling or tell me the facts and circumstances, what was going on? I pointed to the ceiling, told everyone to get out. And you did that because you were angry with them and wanted them to leave? Yes, because they were bringing illegal substances around and threatening to putting it in my truck and other things. All right, so you showed the revolver to Ms. Phillips and Mr. Yacht, is that right? Well, Mr. Yacht was already out the door. Well, did he see it? 
I honestly, I don't know. I don't think, I don't believe so. Because he was standing by the fridge by the doorway, which is about so, three feet. So you got the revolver out. Who was in the room at the time when you came out with the revolver? Miss Phillips. Mr. Yacht was not there? He was by the fridge all the way across the apartment, which is uh, next to the front door. It's about, I'd say, four feet. All right, so he was still in the apartment. Well, he was going through the doorway already. And you put the, you pointed the, you pointed the revolver towards the ceiling and told everyone to leave. Yes, ma'am. In regard to the assault and or assault and battery on Mr. Yacht. I guess I'm trying to get a handle on what happened here. Mr. Seibel, do you want to ask some questions? Uh, your client seems very reluctant to make out the elements here. Your Honor, the, the police report indicates that Mr. Yacht reported this to the police and told the police that he did witness my client brandishing the gun toward the ceiling. Um, so he he must have seen it, at least. I, I, I didn't know that that there would be any dispute about him seeing it. That's my understanding was that he did see it. Mr. Capel, do you think that's possible that Mr. Yacht did in fact see you waving the gun around? Yeah, it's possible. So you think he also could have heard you demanding that everyone leave while you were waving the gun around? He was already at the door because I demanded that before I even came out of the bedroom. As I was coming out of the bedroom, I said, get, the, get out of my apartment. As you were showing the gun to him. Well, I had it in my hand, yes, pointed at the ceiling. Okay. Well, no, I started exiting the bedroom with the revolver in my hand before I hit the doorway, because my bed's probably six feet from the doorway. As I was getting out, I said, Get out of my house. And I came through the doorway with the revolver in the air. All right, at the ceiling. So do you believe that you recklessly or heedlessly or willfully or wantonly used, carried, handled, or discharged that uh, firearm revolver without due caution and circumspection for the right safety or property of others? Well, I believe that I was following the th uh, standard round law, but I might have been misinformed about that. Do you think you acted with due caution for the right safety and property of others when you were fly flailing the gun around that day? I wasn't flailing around, but um, I'd say it wasn't safe. So no one forced you to take the gun out. You did that of your own free will? Yes, it was a spur of the moment thing. I was just sick of all the threats and she had already called my previous employer. Um, I used to haul mail for LR Vincent and told him I was doing meth, drinking and driving and a whole spiel of stuff. So I feared that they could easily place illegal substances in my vehicles especially with her having a spare key. I just, I didn't know how to go about doing it because obviously I didn't want the cops to come search my truck and then find there are drugs in it. And then, you know. Okay, just, just answer the questions, okay? I'm answering them, honestly. All right, then in respect to the matter, I think there's, a sufficient factual basis for the three charges as amended. Are you are you satisfied, Mr. Siminski? I am, Your Honor. Are you, Mr. Seibold? Yes, Your Honor. 
Is either counsel aware of any promises, threats, or inducements in order to get Mr. Capel to plead guilty that have not been placed on the record at this time, Mr. Siminski? No, Your Honor. How about you, Mr. Seibold? No, Your Honor. And does counsel believe the courts complied with the taking of pleas under MCR 6.610, Mr. Seibold? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Siminski? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Capel, I'm going to find you've made out the elements of the three offenses as amended. I'm also finding your pleas this afternoon have been made freely, voluntarily, and understandingly. I'm going to accept your guilty pleas and find you guilty of the charges. I'm going to give you a phone number. You need to call probation now. They're going to be making a pre sentence report with what, what punishment they think is appropriate. Make sure you have gone over that with Mr. Seibel prior to the sentencing date I'm going to give you. In the meantime, all the terms of your bond remain in place. They'll also let you know how much your fines and costs are. They are due at the time of sentencing. We're looking at January 12th, 2023 at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, up 30 seconds. Does that work for you, Mr. Seibel? He's here on another matter. I'm sorry, what was the date? All right. January 12, 2023, 9 o'clock in the morning. You're here on another matter, evidently. Yes, that'll work. All right, Mr. Capel, call 906-774-7522. I'm sorry, Your Honor. That was January 12th. January 12th at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then yeah. the phone number is 906-774-7522. That's for probation. Call there now. Okay. In the meantime, your bond terms remain in place. Anything else we can cover on this file today? And then Mr. Se uh, Siminski? No, Your Honor. Mr. Seibold? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions then, Mr. Capel? Um, no, Your Honor. All right. Stay in touch with your lawyer. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Disconnect now. Thank you.